We do have time for a question and answer period. Uh, please raise your hand and Jeremy will bring the microphone to you. Yeah, Martin Dubravic from Michigan. And uh, just wanted to say thank you to all of you up there for doing this. And a few people have asked me, I'm gonna spend just about 30 seconds or a minute. In Michigan, we've got legislation that's a little more bold. It basically says you can't discriminate against a physician based on their certification status, period. And that legislation is hung up in committee, and that's where we're at in Michigan, but we're, we're optimistic. The Michigan State Medical Society has taken this issue on as their pet project. They feel it's a membership enhancer because they've been hemorrhaging like, like a lot of these organizations have with membership. Uh, it's been very frustrating. I really wanted to beat <coughs> Dave um, to the punch and have our legislation pass first. But uh, I am proud to say that Dr. Nora, I read in Medical Economics, she termed the um, Oklahoma legislation as appalling. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, well, I just wanted to, I wanted to say about, the, the last speaker talked about striking. And um, I understand how, especially for young physicians, I'm not gonna reboard certify again, I've done it three times also. But the young people, I understand, you want to be on, you, you can't afford the economic hit. But the one thing that you can do is not, is leave your medical society. I mean, I had the experience of the, the American Academy of Orthopedics, or the fellow, you know, the American Academy of Orthopedics, not the board, that three years in a row I wrote them letters about their increasing dues. And it kept going up and up and up as our reimbursements going down, down, down. And finally I wrote a letter of resignation, didn't send a check, and I still didn't get a response. None of that time. So I recognized that they don't really care about their members. If you, those, what you showed there was the ABMS depends on money from the specialty society. So if everybody just, there's no economic hit, nobody cares whether you're a fellow of the American Academy or whatever. So, you know, when you resign and you send them a letter and say, I'm resigning because you haven't stood up against MLC. You get rid of MLC, I'll consider coming back. That's a real economic hit to our economic, to the specialty societies. And I really think that's an Achilles heel. Yeah, that, that's a huge point. Um, the uh, Council on Medical Subspecial Societies, sorry, I'm, I can't see you from behind the door. There we go. Uh, that, uh, that society is in bed with the mock process, and uh, uh, I, I had that very uh, significant decision myself to make with the Heart Rhythm Society. I was a young investigator in the Heart Rhythm Society, and it was probably one of the most proud moments I ever had in my medical career. Um, and I, it was, you know, I was brand new. I really thought this was a cool thing. Um, and I wrote a blog post about uh, my, my frustrations with the fact that the Heart Rhythm Society was now siding with this corrupt system. And um, this year, uh, both the ACC and the HRS will not receive money from me. Um, and I think that that is a wonderful way to uh, send your message loud and clear and when they decide to side with physicians instead of the bureaucratic uh, stranglehold that we're all supporting when we support our our organizations then I think it's worthwhile uh, these guys are making a lot of money teaching mock courses that don't need to be taught and they're gonna have to figure out another source of revenue if people get on board behind that unfortunately a lot of us look at it well gosh I'm gonna lose my heart rhythm society journal and my joint, you know, my Journal of the American College of Cardiology, and that's why God made the internet, you know, and you can, you can get pretty much whatever you need that way. I'm family practice. I presented my clinic in Orlando, so some people know what I do. It's a simple clinic all by myself. I have no reason to be board certified anymore. Passed that board three times. Um, don't plan to do anything else other than I'm asking why would I want to be in the NBA PAS? And you know, the reason why, when I'm independent practice all by myself, clinical practice, no hospital, anything. And the other question would be, why is it for only two years? Because I'm trying to decide right now, my board certification will expire at the end of this year, and I'm trying to decide that I want you to be board certified when you come into it. And I don't know much about it, but I was just trying to ask, why is it just for two years? Right, exactly. um, I have no idea why it's two years. I can tell you right now that they're the only alternative to what's going on. Um, I am not a member of the NBPAS yet. 
but um, knowing the efforts that they're putting forth and trying to develop an alternative, I think this will be our fastest way to, to at least trying to wedge through the, the, the financial constraints that are happening. Um, honestly, I think Paul Tierstein himself has already said publicly that he doesn't want to have it go on forever either. He would like to see Mach go away. But uh, for now, this was what he thought would be the best alternative uh, to actually have something that might be uh, truly competitive. But he's running into the same problems with the insurance industry uh, in the hospitals, uh, getting them on board. It's, unless the insurance companies are going to recognize NBPAS, it's going to be hard to get a lot, of, a lot more hospitals on board. Question, this is tangential really, but I think somehow it must tie in because the AMA is real big on it and so are some of our state and local medical societies and that is this high dollar AMA quote unquote leadership forum that they're trying to funnel physicians into and I'm wondering, you pay, you pay a lot of money to go be a physician leader and the AMA comes and teaches you that how is that woven into their grand scheme of things? Does anyone know? Thank you. I think it's their next set of bureaucrats that they want to have working it at the AMA. That's the only reason I can think of it. I think most physicians who are true physicians are leaders. They don't need a course on how to do it. We have to talk to people ourselves. Uh, to follow up on that question, uh, I don't have a lot of experience with the whole program, but I do know people who are leaders in the, uh, at least from here, that are going towards the top tier of AMA, and I'm not very impressed. When I discuss these ideas of getting rid of MOC and going to more cash practices, I got a comment, well, that's never going to happen again. I mean, they just, it's just, their goals are different than ours. So I would run away from a program that, like that. My name is Tracy Raglan. I'm a general internist pediatrician from Kentucky. I just wanted to share a little bit about the legislation in Kentucky. Um, Go Kentucky. We, uh, <laughs> we would actually have been the number one state to pass a cool uh, bill. I just wanted to share a bit about what, what happened. Um, I was on the board of the Greater Louisville Medical Society, brought the ALEC uh, model legislation to the Medical Society, uh, and uh, as a as, as a med county medical society, we put together uh, a presentation for the Kentucky Medical Association, um, and there was almost zero pushback except for a couple academic people and uh, a, a doctor that is actually tied somehow to the Federation of State Medical Boards. But it just sailed through the uh, county medical society and passed the Kentucky Medical Association Basically, the resolution said, you know, study this ALEC model legislation and uh, pursue, you know, pursue uh, uh, legislation. Uh, so, what ha and, and the ALEC uh, model legislation, you know, addresses the state medical board, the hospitals, and the insurers. Well, uh, several, uh, probably about half a dozen docs including uh, Dr. Or Senator Alvarado, who's a doctor, a MedPeds doctor, sponsored, he sponsored the legislation and we uh, just went to, went to the legislators and lobbied it ourselves. Everybody, the legislators were on board. What happened, and this is so interesting, I think it speaks to, you know, the problem we have with so many doctors are just involved with these corporate entities um, the, it would have sailed and Kentucky would have been the number one state to get the full, you know, medical board, insurers, hospitals can't, you know, require this. The reason in Kentucky, our bill, our law just says the medical board can't require it. The reason for that is one of the perennial members of the Kentucky Medical Association board is also a big uh, internal medicine doctor, member of the ACP, a higher up employee, employee of Baptist Health System. 
overseas nurse practitioner clinics for Baptist. Actually, strong-armed Senator Alvarado sat him down, said, you know, no, this would be, this would be government interfering with private industry. <laughs> and this would harm the autonomy of doctors on like medical executive staffs of hospitals. So this is a doctor who stopped the legislation in Kentucky based on those grounds. I'm amazed it, it, it didn't get stopped earlier to be honest with you because uh, I'm from Illinois. Oh my God, it's not going anywhere. Uh, it's a very difficult thing. Of course, we, I'm in the uh, hornet's nest of all of this. ABMS, Joint Commission Accreditation of Hospitals, CMSS, which is the Council on Medical Subspecialty Societies, the American Hospital Association, all of them, the AOA, all, all from Chicago. So, and they're all within blocks of one another. So, to think for one minute that, that one guy doesn't know what the other, when I, when I spoke at the AMA meeting, I had the uh, chairman of the board of the AMA there. I had the chief executive officer of the American College of Physicians there. I had uh, Lois Nora from the ABMS there. Met all of them, except Dr. Nora, she wouldn't come up and say hi. Uh, but I did get a chance to ask her a question. I asked her one question. I said, have you ever studied what happens to a person who fails your examinations? And she said, I, uh, well, that's not, it, it was like I was asking Bill Clinton, you know, what's the meaning of is? Okay, it, it was a very interesting, she, she just like totally turfed the question. And unfortunately, it was not on videotape because we videotaped the rest of the, of the conversation. But I think it's very revealing that these people don't really care about any of that stuff. What they care about is the money flow. And that's where we're going to have to, we're going to have to get, it's going to have to be ugly. And I think the only two places we're going to win is legislation and legal. That's it. And in fact, as I recall, Dr. Nora was not participating in uh, MOC until she was appointed to her position on the ABMS. So if it has such a great value to it, why was that? Right. Next question. I'm Ken Crispin from Dayton, Ohio, and uh, the, thank you, bravo, for three excellent presentations. Um, the question was asked as far as the uh, ABIM, as far as why the IRS didn't go after them for their mm -hmm. lobbying activities, and I'd like to suggest uh, maybe two or three different uh, possibilities. One is that, uh, remember that Dr. Cassell went straight from CEO of ABIM to being CEO of National Quality Forum, mm -hmm. NQF. And also remember that Dr. Richard Barron went from NQF, National Quality Forum, to the CEO of ABIM. Um, where does the National Quality Forum get all its funding? Well, it happens to get a vast amount from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid. And what does it do? Well, it basically funnels funds in uh, well, it basically is, is a method whereby private entities can get their, their, their uh, products approved as being quality. Now, the other thing is that they don't have, the, the ABIM does not have to do lobbying. They have direct access through NQF to all of these legislators. So they have direct access and they meet with them periodically and all the time. And so they don't really need to do any lobbying from those kinds of activities. Now, uh, you've had but, but they did. And that's against the law. It is. OK, and, and, just for the record. And you've hinted <laughs> that this is maybe criminal activity. But I'm going to come right out and say that it is. And these people are criminals. And it's not my assessment. It's the assessment of the US Department of Justice when Dr. Charles Denham received $11 million, roughly, in a kickback. Mm -hmm. Care Fusion was fined about $40 million from, by the US Department of Justice. That's their assessment, that there was illegal kickback going on. And that then spawned Christine Cassell to have to disclose some of her own conflicts of interest. And now, I'm gonna say, that it's not my decision, but it was the U.S. Department of Justice's decision that these people are criminals. 
And I think we should shout this from the rooftops. I think we should point out that one part of government is facilitating this kind of criminal activity, and another part of, adjustment, uh, of justice, the U.S. Department of Justice, is fining the people for doing this. Now, one more thing before I leave, and before I close, is that uh, all of this with Dr. Charles Denham just about didn't happen as far as being caught because it only came to light because one of the employees or one of the directors of CareFusion uh, became a little disgruntled and brought it to the U.S. Department of Justice. But I suspect that there's a lot more of this kind of thing going on and we should not let these people forget it. We need to talk about it. We need to write about it. This is criminal activity. Thanks. Why don't we take uh, one more brief uh, comment or question, then we need to move on to the business meeting. Uh, here, right here. Uh, okay. I just want to thank all three of the speakers. Uh, I, the, some of the people may not be aware. I just want to make one comment. I think that this issue is of national importance. Um, you know, the ACA uh, or the, uh, I mean, sorry, AHA Hospitalist Association, uh, they're also very powerful. Um, for the gentleman that asked from Florida why participate in NVPAS, we're all going to be older someday. And um, insurance companies and hospitals are forcing people out. And it's directly related to MOC. So I just uh, was asked to admit a surgical abdomen case uh, about a couple months ago uh, as an internist. And I said no, because the surgeon didn't want to come in. And the next uh, two days, all my calls were canceled from that hospital. So it's heavily money driven. They are using internists to do the work, scut work of other specialties in the middle of the night. Um, and they're using internists to force people out from the ICU to the floor to save revenue. So everybody is going to be affected by this. Thank you. And I'd like to thank all of our panelists uh, for their presentations. If you have other questions, you can approach them individually. Uh, please do stay for the business meeting, which is up next. I'd like to make one last comment, if I may. This is a very friendly crowd. But if we all go home with one thing to think about, is how the hell do we get this message out? Uh, everything else is, is uh, this is a tiny meeting, quite frankly. And there are very uh, sympathetic ears here. There are very many people who A, don't care, or B, uh, can't see the importance or don't even know about it yet. Um, if you do nothing else, even if you guys, you know, just head out and head home, uh, send a blast email, uh, link to a couple of the talks, link to my blog, link to uh, the change uh, research or, uh, uh, dot org website, okay, so that we can start to really get people motivated about this. Um, we're, it's going to be a lot of work, and this is not a simple matter. Uh, there's a lot of forces trying not to have physicians have a voice anymore in healthcare. So um, do yourself a favor. This is really nice, but our biggest mission is going to be to get out and get the word spread. Thanks. Well said. Thank you.